I know we, uh, are, are a few of us today. I'm going to do this as, a, as if we had a big crowd here today because <laughs> we are filming it and yeah. it will be on our local community cable access. My name is Scott Santino and I'm the education manager for Mass Audubon's North Shore region. I've had this wonderful opportunity to do education for Mass Audubon since 2001. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to be able to teach programs for children as you know, pre-K all the way through to um, bringing people on natural history trips and tours. And so uh, all audiences are a lot of fun and I learn a lot from my audiences as well. So what I want for today is to be as much of a conversation as possible. So Eugene, Janet, if you have questions and so forth, please feel free to ask as we go along. What we're gonna do is we're gonna dive into this wonderful activity called bird feeding. A lot of people do it. A lot of people have, you know, myths or know of myths that go along with bird feeding. I'm going to try to break down some of those myths as far as if I don't fill up my bird feeders, will my birds die, for example? Or am I serving up my birds to hawks because I have feeders out there? That's another one that's not necessarily true. And then we'll also talk a little bit about birds and protection of birds. And then lastly, we're going to end with what I like to call a little bird quiz. We're going to play Name That Bird. And it's going to be a few birds that hopefully you are seeing at your feeders. They're year-round residents that we can see throughout the year. So here's what we're gonna break it up. Beginning of bird conservation in North America, you know, why do I have a job, for example? Where did Mass Audubon come from? We'll talk a little bit about why people enjoy bird watching. Bird watching, believe it or not, is a billion dollar industry here in the United States. And then we'll talk about keys to attracting birds. So if you do have your feeders out there, we'll talk a little bit about maybe ways in which you can tweak them if you choose or to add more to your array. And then finally, as I mentioned, we'll do that little quiz at the end. So believe it or not, in the 1800s, the millinery trade was something that was a big business here in North America. Hunters were going out and they were shooting birds and those dead birds were being used in women's fashion mainly in hats. And so this practice that was happening would often happen in spring because the birds have their wonderful, beautiful plumage in spring, right? But that's a problem there because that's when the birds are doing what? Molting. They're, they're going to be molting. They're also going to be nesting. And so at the time in which many of these birds, like these egrets, were being killed for their plumage, their eggs or young were being left on the nest for dead. And so there were a number of species that we were losing here, and they were becoming rare. And so because of this, our founding mother, Harriet Hemingway, who was a Bostonian, she thought that this fashion was absolutely horrible. And her and her cousin, Nina Hall, started inviting ladies over for tea parties to talk about why are you wearing this stuff on your bodies, on your heads? It was really the first, for Mass Audubon, grassroots effort for conservation. And what they eventually did was they were able to get some gentlemen to join their tea parties, and that was the beginning of North America's first Audubon Society, Mass Audubon. And so there's lots of different Audubons. There's national, there's different state, New Hampshire, New Jersey. <laughs> Mass Audubon was the first one. And because of their efforts, these ladies, it led to the creation of the 1918 Mig Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which gave migratory species protection. And what that means is you're not allowed to shoot them, of course. You're not even allowed to have their feathers, their nests, or their eggs in hand unless you have the appropriate permit. And that's just to ensure that these birds can finish their life cycles. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are things like waterfowl that you can hunt, right? that's regulated. And then there are non-native species that don't have protection as well, things like house sparrows and European starlings. But all of our native migratory species have this protection, and it's thanks to our founding mothers. For me, bird watching got started mainly because of this bird. A lot of people have what they call a spark bird, something that connects them to this wonderful group of animals. And I remember it quite vividly. I was home from college, I was in my early 20s, and I was looking out the, the glass window in my home where I grew up in Carver, Massachusetts, down near Plymouth, and there were all these things on the lawn that are typically there, you know those robins that just kind of blend in everywhere. And this bird was on the lawn with them. 
It didn't look like that. It looked much different, in fact. And this was the first time in my life that I stopped and got curious and wanted to learn more about birds. And this doesn't happen for everyone, but a number of people I speak with have the so-called spark bird. And so this is my spark bird, the northern flicker, which is a type of woodpecker. Believe it or not, as I mentioned before, there are lots of people who enjoy bird watching. As far as recreational activities go, bird watching is the second most popular activity in the United States behind gardening. And so if you're thinking, well, you know, nobody really does this. I'm just doing it in my backyard. Maybe I'm a nerd, a bird nerd, because I enjoy these animals. You're not alone. There's a lot of people that enjoy and want to do this activity. So why? Why do people do this? Well, for a lot of folks, there is a connection. You know, we're all animals on this planet, too. And it's nice to feel a connection to some of the other things that we see outside. And so a lot of people are connected to bird watching because of their beauty. This is a picture I took down in Florida of a beautiful green heron in its breeding plumage. A lot of people also find birding mysterious. What is that thing that's making noise at night? It's a bit of a puzzle. Oh, I know that there's something at my feet, but I've never seen it before. What could it be? And so for some, the mystery of bird watching is what brings them in and connects them to this fantastic activity. One of the things that really connected me in wanting to learn more about birds is because they're so social. They make lots of noise and vocalizations and you can work hard and almost learn a second language. You can learn bird. You may not be able to speak back to them, but you can understand who's saying what. And here's an example of a bird song that you might be hearing in your yards. This is one of the songs of the Carolina Wren. They're loud and they're small. You say to yourself, I have no idea how a little bird like this can make such a racket in my yard. A lot of people also enjoy bird watching because you can do it anywhere. This is a picture I took when I had the opportunity to lead bird watchers in the Galapagos pre-pandemic. And so I was in the other panga taking a photograph of these people looking at and photographing blue-footed boobies. And so people like to travel around the world to look for birds. And in this particular instance, they like to look for what's called endemic species. Endemic species are birds that you can't find anywhere else in the, in the world. And so people travel around the world and around North America to find them. I found that camaraderie is a big part of bird watching. Bird watchers enjoy sharing information with each other. This is a picture I took down in uh, Cape Coral, Florida. I brought a group down to southern Florida. And this is a For Florida scrub jay that landed on my friend's bill hand here. And you can see the other bird watchers there getting a, a view of this. And so, as I mentioned to you before, Kathy, if you see bird watchers on the side of the road or at the refuge or somewhere and they're looking, feel free to stop. You know, you may want to be a little quiet, so that way you don't scare something away if it's close. And ask them what they're seeing. And I find that most times, they're going to be very nice and they're going to want to share what it is they're seeing. And lastly, they're accessible. You don't have to travel halfway around the world to find them. Most people can look out their window and see if there's some birds out there. And so that's what we're going to dive into. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can attract these wonderful creatures to your yard. Any questions so far? All right, my pace okay? I'm not going too fast? All right, all right, great. So, keys to attracting birds. Now, you both told me today that you have bird feeders in your yard, so you probably have some really nice tricks of the trade. I'm going to share some recommendations that I have that perhaps can enhance what you're already doing if you choose. Being an ecologist, when I looked at my yard and I wanted to put out bird feeders, I looked at it from the perspective of something I call habitat. How do I create habitat? Because if I can create a habitat for these animals, I'm gonna be more likely to have a diversity of birds visiting my yard. And the three most essential, important parts of habitat are food, shelter, and water. And I think for a lot of people who feed birds, right, they think of the food piece, obviously, 
Seasonally, they may include the water, which is great, but the shelter piece is one that I'm not sure a lot of people even have on their radar. How do I provide shelter, right? So here's what I have for an example. This is the side of my yard, and you'll see my feeders are about 12 feet away from these big eastern hemlock trees. If you put a bird feeder out in the middle of your yard, and there's no cover around, birds are not gonna wanna take a chance to go and get that food if they're wide out in the open and there's potential predators for them, things like hawks or cats or other you know, potential things that wanna eat them. And so by putting some cover around in the area, preferably native trees and shrubs, you, birds are gonna be more likely to visit your area. There's all different kinds of foods you can put out there. I like putting food out based on a seasonal basis Different types of food in different seasons will attract different species. You can see here in May, I took down my feeder off of my shepherd's hook, and I stuck half of an orange on top of it, and the Baltimore Oriole came in to eat the orange. And then water is another important element. Birds need water. They like taking baths in water. It's important to make sure you keep your bird baths clean. Here are some other things to consider with that habitat piece. Think about plants. If you can and you enjoy gardening, if you're putting in things like shrubs and perennials, please make sure they're native or ask and look for native. Also ask if they're organic. A lot of the things that we buy at garden centers are treated with something called a neonicotinoid or neonix. It's a systemic pesticide that you can find in the roots, in the stem, in the leaves. And if you enjoy hummingbirds and other pollinators, it's even in the flowers and in the nectar. So you want to try to find plants that are organic and not treated with this neonicotinoid. If you can, like here, leave up dead trees. Now I'm a homeowner, I don't have any dead trees that are gonna be a danger to my property, fall on my house or my car, but if there are some dead trees in my yard that are off to the side, I'm gonna let them be. Because these, what I like to call snags, are gonna be great for things like woodpeckers and other cavity nesting species. And if you don't have any big snags, you can also put up bird boxes. And that's what's here in the middle. I just screwed into this dead pine tree. Back in November, I went to go open this up and clean the nest out from last spring. I know that tufted titmice nested in there. And guess what scurried out? Flying squirrels. There were two flying squirrels sitting in my, my, my bird box, which was pretty neat. So I left it be. Did they go back? I assume so. <laughs> I haven't been back to check because I didn't want to disturb them. <laughs> yeah. So that's part of what I'd love for you to think about a little bit is, you know, when you're putting out these, these wonderful feeders to bring these organisms in, you know, how can I make this a, a, a habitat for these animals? A lot of birds enjoy seed, but they don't eat seed 12 months a year. In the springtime, when they're raising young, they want lots of big, fat caterpillars. And so if you have plants in which butterflies and moths want to lay their eggs on, the birds are going to be happy because they're going to have lots of bugs to eat. All right, so let's jump into some of the different types of feeders and how I have found them to be helpful in attracting the most birds to my yard. And also, you know, minimizing waste, for example, right? If you are big into bird feeding, it's a little bit of an investment to buy the feeders and the suet and the seed and all of that. So how do you get the most bang for your buck, so to speak? This is a tube feeder with a beautiful purple finch on it. This is my state bird. I live in southern New Hampshire. And with the tube feeder, a couple of things you can do is this. When I have a tube feeder, I only put the black oil sunflower in it. I don't put mixed seed in. And this is why. There's a lot of birds that prefer the black oil sunflower. It's higher in protein than, say, cracked corn and millet. And so what a number of birds will do is they'll come over, they'll sit on your feeder, and they'll grab millet, and they'll go, and they'll spit it on the ground. And they'll grab the cracked corn, and they'll spit it on the ground until they get what they're looking for, which is the black oil sunflower or husked sunflower, which you can also get and that avoids any mess on the ground with all those uh, sunflower husks. The other thing you can do with a lot of feeders is you can get this little extra plate here. This plate helps to catch some of the, 
the husks that fall, it also allows for some of our larger birds to get to the feeder. Things like blue jays or morning doves or cardinals that need a little bit of a larger surface area in order to sit on. Here's the one thing I'll caution you. You'll notice here that with this particular feeder, that the hole is a pretty good sized hole. I've had people buy different types of seed and they put it in the tube and the hole's too big and all the seed comes running out. So it's important that you fit the right seed with the right feeder. Here's our next feeder. This is called a thistle feeder. Thistle seed is not the same plant that we have around here that has the big spiky thorns that you might not want in your yard. This is called Niger, and it's something that you can pick up at your local you know, bird feeding store. It's small, and so what you need is you need a feeder like this one that has little holes so the seed doesn't come running out on you. Finches love Niger thistle. If you have Niger thistle, you're probably going to get things like these beautiful American goldfinches, the purple finch, and in some years, we have these species that come down from the Arctic or the boreal forest to be with us. Things like uh, red poles, pine siskins, they too enjoy niger thistle. How about that mixed seed though? This is what we call a covered platform. The platform feeders are great because some of the bigger birds that can't cling to the side of a tube feeder, they can land on the side of the platform and eat away. In my platform feeder, things like sparrows, juncos, cardinals, morning doves, those blue jays I mentioned before, they'll come in and they'll land on the, the covered platform. And this is where I put my mixed blend seed in. I just pour it down on the bottom, right? Here's what I'd say about mixed blend seeds, however. There are a good number that you can find that are inexpensive. Those cheap mixed blends likely have red millet. Red millet is an additive that most of our birds don't eat. And so if you've ever put mixed seed out, you probably notice why is all this little red round ball still in my feed or how can no one's eating it? What you want is you want white millet. If you can buy the white millet blends, the birds will gobble up the white millet as well. They are a little bit more expensive, but you're reducing the waste. And so that's a, that's a good thing. We also have suet feeders. And so this is a classic suet cage. You can buy suet that comes in these little triangles or little rectangles rather, that fits right into the little cage. And this was a really neat thing. This happened where this is a wood warbler called a pine warbler that doesn't typically come to feeders. But this bird never migrated south. It was hanging out in my yard during the winter. And there's no bugs for it to eat in the winter, of course, or it's much harder to find them. And so this little pine warbler was coming to the suet cake to eat some of that high protein suet to help it get through the winter months. Now, for suet feeders, I don't typically keep my suet feeders out 12 months a year. Because when it gets really hot, the suet can spoil or get really gunky, right? But you know what you can do with your suet feeder? You can get creative and you can put something like oranges in there instead. <laughs> and that'll attract birds like our Baltimore Oriole. I've had Scarlet Tanager at my feeders before eating more, uh, oranges. Catbirds, red-bellied woodpeckers. So there's a number of what I would call nectivores that will come and want to eat your oranges. Here's the thing with oranges though. You want to make sure that you're changing them out on a daily or bi-daily basis because especially in a warm you know, May or June day, you know, they could spoil pretty quickly. We don't want to leave that out there for our birds. <coughs> there is no right way to feed birds. Everyone does it in their own way that brings them joy, right? For me, I like to keep my <coughs> seed out from Labor Day, that's when I usually put it out, and then around Memorial Day, <coughs> I usually take the seed feeders down. And that's because, again, most of our birds are more interested in eating bugs than seed. <coughs> there are some people that like to keep one feeder up during the summer months because they like to watch the parents bring their newly hatched young to their feeders. So that way they keep on getting birds to come back. 
There is one feeder that I do put out, usually at the end of April, and that's our hummingbird feeder. And so we have a hummingbird, Mrs. Hummingbird, on this feeder. It's really easy to make nectar. This is what I'd recommend, though. Sometimes when you buy your hummingbird feeder, it comes with this little pouch, and it has a, uh, like a sugary substance in there that you mix with water, and it's red. That red coloration is food coloring, and what it does is it makes our hummingbirds sick. And so we shouldn't use any of that food coloring. What you want to do is just grab regular old granulated sugar, one part to four parts water, if you're impatient like I am, I put it on the stove and warm it up so I can mix it up pretty quickly. And as soon as it's cooled, then I'll put it back into my hummingbird feeder. This is what I will say though. If it sits out for too long, your nectar can spoil. So whether it's empty or half full, I change my nectar on a weekly basis, usually every Sunday. I'm around on Sunday doing yard work, I'll give it a good cleaning, and then I'll put out some fresh nectar. And the hummingbirds absolutely love it. You can see Mr. and Mrs. come to the feeder in early spring, and by the time you're in June, July, the young are now coming in, which is a lot of fun to see as well. Beware, right? I've had a lot of people say, well, I get so sad when I find a bird at my feeders that's been eaten by a hawk. And it does happen from time to time. We have some hawks like this Cooper's hawk that is specialized in eating birds. Now one of the things that I looked up was, are we serving our little friends up to hawks by putting out bird seed, right? Seems kind of logical. What I came up with was, I, I, this was a study that Cornell Lab of Ornithology did, was that because there are more birds around a feeding area, there are more eyes and there are more voices. And so it's really hard for things like hawks to catch our little birds at feeding stations because there's more warning. They're much more susceptible to be getting you know, picked off by a hawk if they're off on their own foraging somewhere else. And so this myth of I'm um, serving up my birds to hawks by putting out bird feeders is nothing more than a myth. That just doesn't happen. We also want to make sure that we're cleaning our bird feeders. It's really important to make sure that things like mold and stuff aren't getting in there. They're not waterproof, right? If we have a driving rain that comes in sideways, some of that moisture might get in there. On a number of occasions, I've had people say, are the birds gone because they're not coming to my feeders? And I'll say to them, Please go out and check out your feeder. Take a look at the seed. See what the seed is doing. And this one person in particular took the time to call me back and said, thank you so much for recommending that. The sunflower in the tube feeder had started to germinate because <laughs> of all the moisture that had gotten in there. And so if you're finding that birds aren't coming to your feeders, you know, take them down, give them a good cleaning. You can use a solution where it's one part bleach to 10 part water. Just make sure that after you clean them and give them a good rinse, that you let them dry sufficiently because you don't want to put that new seed down into a, a tube that has moisture in it. Sometimes we get birds that have gunky eyes at our feeders, a type of avian conjunctivitis. If you're seeing sick birds at your feeders, it's really important to take those down for a couple of weeks to make sure that those birds aren't passing on their illness. How often should you clean the feeders? I do mine seasonally. Um, you know, I think if you were to, to research it, they would probably tell you to do it more often. Um, I, I ha personally haven't had any problems, but yeah, I, I usually do it three times a year, and then I, I put them up for the summer. As I mentioned, I take them okay. out for the summer. Yes. This summer there was a warning out about water feeders. What was that all about? So one of the th weird things that happened, and I'm not sure that anyone really knows for sure, or, or either that or people aren't letting you know, the, the right information out, is that in the mid-Atlantic region, we had a good number of birds that were dying off. There was a bird die off. And the common thread 
was that all of these were birds that were what we call hatch year birds. They were the babies from this past year. And there's some speculation that there was something in the environment, perhaps a pesticide, because the parents, where do they feed their young? They feed them bugs and lots of them. And so something was making these birds sick. And based on their symptoms, it looked like some type of neurological ailment, you know, seizures in the birds, right? But it hasn't been released or nobody knows for sure what it was that was harming the birds. We did not see any of that up here in New England. That was mainly down in the mid-Atlantic region. But I read that they were saying don't have them drink out of the water feeders. It wasn't about the seed, it was about the water. Oh. Uh, again, water can be tricky because, um, you know, if you have a bird bath out, it's important to, to, to put fresh water in there every day. Um, so, you know, I, I can't speak to that, spe okay. you know, the, what you're specifically asking me about, but a, a general rule of thumb with bird baths is to, to make sure you're cleaning it and putting fresh water every day because a lot of the birds will defecate in it. And if you don't like mosquitoes, right, sometimes mosquitoes will even lay their eggs in your bird baths if you're not cleaning them on a regular basis. Would you be cleaning the bird bath with the same thing, the water with bleach? You certainly could with yeah. a bleach solution. If you don't want to use bleach, what I will also use is I'll use white vinegar. You know, that way I can just bring the, the bottle, you know, the gallon jug out to the spigot and give it a little, you know, um, scrub and then I use the white vinegar and give it a rinse and, and so that's something that's non-toxic for the birds. If you don't do it regularly, you may need to use something a little bit stronger. On the suet feeder, I notice you have the kind I have, and I have trouble. I have to put wire in and tighten it because the squirrels will open it and take the suet. Do you have that problem too? So I'm going to transition into squirrels, and we can talk a little bit about how we can do it. I, I too, it takes, you know, uh, little hooks, and I hook it so that way squirrels or raccoons can't, you know, um, open it up. But squirrels are a big problem, and, and that's a great segue, Janet, because what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about how to tame squirrels if you choose to do so. A lot of people enjoy all wildlife in their yards, and perhaps seeing a squirrel coming to your feeder is not anything that bothers you. And that's fine and that's great. In my yard, I have tried a few things that I have found that have worked pretty well, but it's taken some trial and error. And I will say that that's something that you may have to do in your yard. You may have to try it out a little bit to see what works. But here's some general rule of thumb. Squirrels can jump approximately six feet up. So we wanna make sure they're not getting, you know, up to our feeders if at all possible. And they can also jump 10 to 12 feet up. And so if you have your feeders in a location that's close to say a porch edge or a tree or something like that, they could leap onto it, right? So one of the things, these are all feeders in my yard here. Let's see, I'll use my finger here. And you'll notice in all three situations, I have my feeders on shepherd's poles with baffles. The shepherd's poles allow you the flexibility to put your feeders wherever you want to put them in your yard. If you want to put them close to shelter, you can put them there. If you want to put them in an area where you can view them out your kitchen window, you can put them there. But if you don't put the baffles on, the squirrels will run right up the shepherd's poles to your feeders. And so these little things that look like little triangles, they prevent the squirrels from getting up and getting to your feeders. I will caution you though, that this time of year, when we get some snow, if we were to get two or three feet of snow, and they're now you know, getting a little head start, you may need to raise up your baffles because they're not as low on the ground anymore, right? They're up on top of that snow and they can jump up and over. There are some feeders that you can use that have cages on them. And you saw that feeder with the denydra thistle with the goldfinches. So that way when the squirrel gets on the feeder, the weight of their bodies whoop, closes the, the, the feeder to them and they can't get the seed. So that's also something you could do. And I haven't personally done this, but they say it's safe to do is that if you put in cayenne pepper into your seed, the birds aren't going to taste it, but the squirrels aren't going to want to eat it because it's spicy, of course. 
And so you can even buy certain types of seed that already have that pepper in it that the squirrels will leave alone. So perhaps those are some tips that might help you, but I will say they are tricky, they're smart, and it takes some trial and error in order to make sure that the squirrels are staying off your feeders if you want them. What about those things over the feeder? Those like awning things? You know those, yep. those uh, plastic, clear plastic? Yeah, th that's another form of baffle that just prevents them from getting from the top. So are you saying that to hang the bird feeder from the tree is not a good idea because it just makes it a lot easier for that squirrel feeder? Absolutely. Yes, yes. And in some instances, um, you know, if the squirrel can get to your feeder consistently and you're not filling it, you know, regularly for them, sometimes they'll even chew it up on you. Okay. Yeah, and, and, you know, you don't want the squirrels chewing and ruining your feeders. Up in my neck of the woods, I have to sometimes be cautious of another mammal that comes to our feeders. That isn't something that we regularly have to worry about here in Newberry, but sometimes bear can also get to your feeders and eat those seeds. All right, any questions about any of the information that we've covered so far about types of seed, types of feeders, creating habitat, and why birds are such an incredible group of animals to, to want to learn about. I have one question. Yes. Um, my neighbor has a cat, and that cat sits below the feeder sometimes. <laughs> I feel like, I know that you know, people think hawks come to the feeder to get their lunch. The cat's just sitting, sometimes like crouched under the shed, like a little freak, <laughs> waiting for lunch to come. And my husband's like, I don't know, maybe we should take that one down. That thing is just sitting on the there waiting. The same thing, cats with as the hawks, the thoughts about that? So not not the same thing, no. Okay. So with cats, we will talk a little bit about cats a little bit more in depth okay. at, at the end as ways in which we can help protect bird populations. Okay. Something that I would invite you to do if this is an ongoing thing, and, and, and your neighbors may think you're crazy, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, cats, of course, are a feline, right? And part of the reason why they're in your yard is because there's some kind of primal genetic interest in wanting to catch and capture prey, even though they have food waiting for them, you know, at home. And so the, the sad thing is even though they catch and kill birds and small mammals, they're not eating them, right? Well, there's a hierarchy in nature. And territories have dominant animals that have a particular range, right? And so my neighbor's cat was doing the same thing. And any time I saw the cat in my yard going by the feeders, I ran out onto yes. my deck and I shouted out, hey, get, right? Yes. And that scurried the cat along. Yes. I was showing that feline that this was my territory and I was the alpha in it. Okay. And I can't remember the last time I've seen it. Well, that's like funny. My husband tells my kids to do that. They're like, Dad, seriously? Seriously. Seriously. And he's like, go, oh, scary away, scary yes. away, scary away. But I'm going to tell him now, like, he's not that insane. No, no, he's not. <laughs> no, okay. no. All right. And we'll talk a little bit more yeah. uh, again at the end about cats. That can be really tricky. It can be a really yeah. tricky situation. Yeah, yeah. All right, any others? All right. So this is meant to be a little fun, a bit of a game. There is a series of, of uh, birds that we're going to look at, the pictures, talk a little bit about identification, and we have an opportunity to see what we already know. And chances are, is I think you probably know more than you think you know, right? These are all resident, meaning that they hear year-round birds. And this is the bird that I think you may have been referring to earlier, Eugene. This is the house finch which does, it lays its eggs in like every potted plant around your yard and so forth. It is a little bit different than the, um, the purple finch, which was at the beginning of the slideshow, which has a, a similar co coloration. If you've ever wanted to learn how to identify birds, there are some great resources out there. Here are three that I have with me at all times. The first one on the left, is a free app created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's called Merlin. And the way Merlin works is it takes you through a series of questions. 
Where are you? What time of year is it? How big was the bird? What color was the bird? And then what it does is it gives you recommendations on what it might be that you were looking at based on the information that you've entered. And so it helps you to identify species. The middle app is an app you do have to pay for. It's not terribly expensive. It's called iBird Pro. And it gives you just a host of information. And there are a number of different guide apps out there. People choose their preferences. There's no right one. I happen to like iBird Pro because it tells you about identification. It plays songs of the birds so you can learn their songs. It shows you range maps. It even gives you information about where do they migrate, what's their breeding territory, things like that. It's a, a nice kind of comprehensive piece of information to have in your hand. And then the one on the right is just the old fashioned bird guide, the, the paper guide, right? There's Sibley's, there's Peterson's, there's National Geographic, there's Kaufman's, there's all different ones. As long as you have one that's fairly up to date, you're in good shape. And the reason why I see that is, if you are dusting off your field guide that was printed back in 1980 or so, chances are pretty good there are birds in there that do not have the same names as they have today, and they're not even arranged in the same families. We've learned a lot over the years in looking at bird DNA, and it's changed a lot of the way that we classify or arrange birds. So a new field guide would be helpful. Question? Does the iBird only work on an iPhone and not Android? I believe there's variations for both. I think okay. you can get it for both. Yep. All right. So here we go. This is our first bird. And what I like to do when I teach ornithology, or in this case, field identification, is to avoid the instinct to want to identify it right out of the gate, right? We want to process looking at characteristics. And so as we look at this bird, we can see that it has a black cap and a black throat. We can see that it has a little bit of rufus on its flanks. That's what we call the side above the belly and below the wing. We can take a look at the bill. The bill tells us an awful lot about the bird because that's what it's going to be foraging for. This is not a big cone-shaped bill like a finch, but it's not a long pointed bill like a wood warbler. It's somewhere in between. I like to think of this bill as kind of like being a bird Swiss army knife. It can utilize and eat lots of different types of food. This, of course, is our Massachusetts state bird. Does anyone know what it is? It's a black cap chickadee. You got it. It's a what? Oh. <laughs> a black cap chickadee. This is our Massachusetts state bird. We see chickadees regularly. They're common. I will add this, however. Chickadees have an association with northern, northeast mixed forests, right? One of the things that we're seeing before our very eyes is that as our climate warms, even fractions of a degree, it's starting to change the structure of our forests. They're becoming more of a southern forest. And that's not to say that trees are pulling their roots up and they're walking north, right? This means that the cold climate trees are starting to die back and they're not going to be as successful. This is a bird by the year 2050 we may have a hard time finding in Massachusetts because of the way that the climate is changing and the way that our forest composition is changing. Some birds are coming up to us. We're seeing more Carolina wrens and red-bellied woodpeckers, but it goes both ways. We could lose some species. Here's our next one. Kind of looks a little bit like the chickadee, but it only has a black cap. It doesn't have the black throat. It has a white throat and white breast and white belly. You can see that the bill is longer and more pointed. The other thing that always amazes me about this bird is something I like to call a behavioral characteristic. They love walking down tree trunks head first. <laughs> Not all birds will do that. Who knows what this one is? You got it. This is our friendly white-breasted nuthatch. All right. 
Yes, there are two birds on this screen, and no, they're not two different species. Some of our birds have something that we call dimorphism, or in this case, dichromatism, in which the male and female are not the same. For this particular species, you can notice that their feather coats are different. Which one's the boy, the one on the right or the left? The right one. You got it. So we think that feathers have evolved for birds for a number of different reasons, one of which is communication. And so for a lot of our birds, the boys are vibrant and bright and prettier, if you want to use that adjective. I think she's particularly beautiful as well. The females are more cryptic in color because they're the ones that spend most of the time sitting where in spring? On nests. On nests, right? You wouldn't want to be bright, big and bright if you were sitting on your nest and young, and so a lot of our females are cryptically colored. Here are a couple of characteristics, of course. They have the tuft on their head. Let's see if I can get my finger in there, right there. That little tuft. And look at that big cone-shaped bill that's orange. I like to say that she puts on her orange lipstick in the morning with those great big bills, right? This, of course, is the, the northern cardinal. You got it. I hope you appreciate a little bit of the dialogue I'm giving before we identify the bird, because I think there's this kind of sense in people that if you name the bird, it's almost like you shut off your ability to, to learn more about it. Well, I already know what it is. Just because you know the name of something doesn't necessarily know you know much about it. And so I like giving a little bit of background information. I find that it find, makes them more interesting. All right. This bird, you can know what it is a mile away looking at its silhouette. It's got a little round head, a plump body, and a long pointed tail, right? You often see these birds on the ground. They're not the most terribly agile birds. You won't see them eating or clinging to the sides of your tube feeders. This is a bird that appreciates those uh, covered platform feeders. It has gray plumage. If you've never looked at this bird's eye ring before, it's stunning. An eye ring here, let's see, I'll use my, whoop, there it is, is the little ring that goes around the eye. You can see it's a beautiful little powder blue color that goes right around the ring. It's almost the color of uh, the masks that you see many people wearing these days. This, of course, is a morning dove. A morning dove. And it's not morning as in good morning dove. It's morning in that it sounds sad when it sings. It's believed that its song is a mournful or sad coo that we hear. It does sing during the day. And what I tell people is if you think you're hearing an owl during the day, chances are pretty good it's a morning dove because their coos are low and hoot-like when they're calling. All right, here's our next bird. This is another friendly year-round resident. They often will hang out with chickadees and titmice. They have a crest like a cardinal, but they're much smaller, and they're not the same color. This species does not have a dimorphism. The boys and the girls look the same, the same feather coat. They have this cute little dark bill and dark face. Let's see, where am I here? Right there. They too have the rufous on the flanks underneath the wing. This is a woodpecker. That's a wonderful guess because its bill is bigger. It's not one of our woodpeckers, however. It's a tufted titmouse. You got it. Huh? And so this little species, again, is very common coming to our feeders, especially if we have those black oil sunflower tubes. This bird, I particularly enjoy. I think a lot of people find them to be a little bullish at feeders, which they can be. They are absolutely stunning, though, with their beautiful blue feather coat. They have that cute little black chin strap and they are super smart. They are part of a family of birds known as corvids or corvidae, and they do amazing things. You'll sometimes see them gobble food down at your feeder to fill up their crop, and they'll go off and they could cash those seeds they're taking for a later consumption at another time 
when your feeders aren't filled. They're pretty crafty like that. This bird, because its plumage is blue, varies depending upon the sunlight. In direct sunlight, it's bright, beautiful blue. In poor sunlight, they almost look kind of gray. Does anyone know what this is? It's a blue jay. It's a blue jay, of they course. They can talk, you know that? Say again? They can talk. <laughs> they have a wonderful vocal repertoire, don't they? I know what I know, but I, <laughs> I witnessed it. They had speech. Said hello. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. This veterinarian has it. Yeah. <laughs> it was injured, that's why he had it. A captive blue jay. But that thing's not a talk. That's amazing. To, to add on to that, there are some blue jays that will mimic hawks as well. And so we know that they can learn sounds. They, they, there's something else. I, I found one. That, I got one of those greenhouse things on there. So I could stick it all over and make a suicide before they yeah. crash into it. So I found a jay when I was mowing. So I picked up my phone. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Yeah. They sure are. They sure are. Yep. Yep. Excellent. I'm, I'm so glad you shared that. And that's something that has also been viewed by other members of its family, including crows and ravens, that they'll mourn the loss of some of their members, which is pretty amazing for birds. If you've ever thought you were insulting someone by calling them a bird brain, you can now take it as a compliment because they are very smart. So of course, that's our blue jay. Now we're getting into some of those birds that like to cling to the sides of trees. This is a bird that will especially enjoy feeding at your suet feeders. They like that high protein diet. This bird has a little bit of red on its head, which of course tells us that this is a boy and not a girl. The bill isn't terribly long for a bird in this family. It's obviously a type of woodpecker, right? We have a number of woodpeckers. Two look fairly similar. One's it's the bigger cousin, and one's the smaller cousin. This is the smaller cousin. This is the, the downy woodpecker. You got it. 20 years ago, when I dove into the world of ornithology, this by far was the most common woodpecker that would come to my suet feeders. Now that our second growth forests are becoming bigger and older, that means there's more standing dead wood, which means there's more places for woodpeckers to breed. And so the hairy woodpecker, the wood, uh, red-bellied woodpecker, and also the pileated woodpecker are all becoming more common in our wooded areas. And you might see all of them at your suet feeders. Speaking of woodpeckers, we'll stick to that group. So this bird has a red crown a nape, which is the back of the head. A lot of people instinctually want to call this bird a red-headed woodpecker. We have a red-headed woodpecker. Its entire head and face and throat and neck are all red. This is not our red-headed woodpecker. This bird gets its name because there's a little bit of reddish hue here on the belly. You got it. So this is a the red-bellied woodpecker. You got it. This is another one of these birds that's tied into avian life, telling us people that things are changing with the climate and in the environment. This is a bird of southern eastern United States. And it slowly but surely made its way up into New England. And so, again, 20 years ago, this is a bird that, you know, you would get pretty excited. Oh, it's a red-bellied woodpecker. You don't see these every day. And now they might be the most common woodpecker that comes to our feeders. All right. <laughs> Bad news. <laughs> you got it. So this bird is a bird that you might not want coming to your bird feed. This is a bird that was introduced into North America and has since naturalized. It is a beautiful bird, though. It has this beautiful kind of rufous on the cap. 
Whoop, there I am. It has a nice gray here. It's got black around the bill and these beautiful little tones of black and brown. It is a handsome bird. Does anyone know what this is? You got it, the English or house sparrow. Male. What makes these birds, say again? Male. It is the male, you got it, excellent. The female looks different. I didn't do the side by side of house sparrow, this is the male. They too are cavity nesters. They want to nest inside bird boxes. They can be pretty aggressive. And so what makes this bird a problem or a species that we don't desire at our feeders and our yards is that they can evict birds like eastern bluebirds or chickadees or titmice or other birds that need cavities. Before we move on, I will say, if you don't want them at your feeders, a couple of things that you can do is you can make sure to keep the seed off the ground. They do not do well on tube feeders. And depending upon the type of tube feeder you have, you know, there are those little perches on the tube feeders that go through. Some models allow you to push them through and take them up. So it's just a tube that goes all the way down. There's nothing to land on. That will dismiss this bird. But the chickadees and titmice and other what I like to call clingers will be able to get to the food and the house sparrow will have to move on. All right. This is a really interesting bird in that it molts in the winter and has a completely different feather coat, except for the wing. I have had a number of people over the years say to me that this bird must be migratory and must leave us in the winter because I don't see them anymore. Would you believe me if I said this bird is the same species as this bird? This is just this bird in spring, and this is this bird coming to our feeders now in winter. This is a American goldfinch. You got it. They have something that's called a basic or winter plumage and an alternate or breeding plumage. They will molt all of their body feathers twice a year so they can look like this in the winter and then look like that in the spring. And this is a male. The males are a little bit showier than the females in spring. He's got that nice kind of black cap there on top of his head. All right, so that concludes our name that bird. I think we scored 100% there. It wasn't meant to be a tough quiz. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to end with us thinking a little bit more about being bird enthusiasts. Myself included, there are things that I know that I could have done in the past that would help bird populations that I didn't do. Recently, there was a report that was released called Three Billion, with a B, Birds Lost. And what happened was, because birds are such a charismatic group of animals, there's a lot of data that has been collected on birds through things called Breeding Bird Atlas, which is organized from the USGS. There's been uh, CBCs, or Christmas bird counts, where people go out every year and collect data on birds. And there's this wonderful citizen science program called eBird, which is free and online. It's run by Cornell, where people enter their observations for scientific information. And from the 1970s to the year 2020, our estimates showed on looking at the scientific data is that we have lost over three billion birds in the United States for various reasons, right? If you enjoy birds and you want them to continue to come to your feeders and you want to go out to Plum Island and see snowy owls and things like that, we need to change some of our behaviors to ensure that these animals are here for generations to come. There are seven simple actions everyone can take to help support bird populations. The first one you mentioned before about making windows safe, right? You mentioned your um, greenhouse, right? 
When you have windows at certain times of day and the sun shines in on them, if you have shrubs and things like that below them, your window becomes a mirror. And when a bird gets flushed and they see the reflection of the shrubs in your window, they don't know they're flying into a window. They think they're flying into those trees that are there. And so you can do things during the daylight hours, put silhouettes up on your windows, right? Um, you could also use some, there's, if you're putting in a new house, believe it or not, there's actually different types of glass that you can use now that have UV, um, you know, colorations in them that the birds can see that we can't. It's to help prevent the birds from striking against windows. One of the things you can do with your feeders is you can either make sure your feeders are far enough away that your windows don't become an issue, or you can put your feeders a couple of feet from your window. That way, if a bird gets flushed, it's not gonna have enough momentum to hurt itself on the window if their feeders are close to your windows. The next one we talked about a little bit earlier. Keep cats indoors. Cats kill lots of birds. Now, if you're a cat owner, don't get me wrong, cats are wonderful pets. There are lots of people that love their pet cats. If you generally love your cat, the, you're gonna wanna keep it inside. The, the general lifespan of an outdoor cat is two years. Because they're outside, they could get parasites, they could get hit by cars, they could get eaten by predators, right? But because you put your animal out into an ecosystem, they now become part of that food web. And so they could also consume things like birds and small mammals. So by keeping your cat inside, you're helping bird populations, and you're also helping to keep your cats healthy longer. Okay. Reduce lawn and plant natives. If you have these big, beautiful green lawns that look like a putting green, there isn't a much life in there. There aren't bugs, and birds like eating bugs. And so something that I've started to do is in, in and around my lawn, my yard, because my kids are grown now, they don't, they don't go out and play soccer or wiffle ball anymore, I've started to put these little patches of perennial gardens to break up the lawn. It's bringing in pollinators, it's bringing in more birds, beautiful flowers, right? It's awesome. Here's the other thing that I'll, I'll, I'll mention about this here. A lot of people, what they'll do in the fall time is they'll, when they rake up the leaves, they'll clean their perennial gardens. They'll remove the old stems and so forth out. All of those little plants that have dried and are, are there now, their flowers, where do they become when they're pollinating? Seeds. They become seeds. If you leave those dried old stalks in your gardens all winter long, you're providing more food for birds. So don't clean up your gardens until the spring because the birds will come and they'll eat those seeds from the perennials. We talked earlier, avoid pesticides, of course. Drink coffee that's good for birds. Well, what on earth does that mean? Here's what it means. Most of our birds are migratory. It means that when they come in and they breed, things like the Baltimore Oriole, the gray catbird, right? All those wood warblers. They don't spend the year with us, they migrate south. Many of them winter in the tropics in Central and South America. What is one of the main crops that is farmed in Central and South America? It's coffee beans, right? And a lot of coffee bean growers, what they do is they clear cut the tropical rainforest they put up these monocultures of coffee plants, and now it's easier to harvest, and now you're drinking cheaper coffee, right? Well, when our Baltimore Oriole leaves Newberry and flies down to, say, Belize or Guatemala, and their forest is gone, what's gonna happen to our Baltimore Oriole? They may not come back next spring, right? So what you can do is you can go into your markets, you can go online, and you can order and drink bird-friendly coffee. This is coffee that's grown in shade underneath the tropical rainforest. And so believe it or not, in our purchase power of getting a cup of coffee, we can help birds as well. 
We talked a little bit before, we can reduce plastics. The more single-use plastic we leave on the shelves, the better for our wildlife. And then the last one here, we can all do easily. Share our knowledge and enthusiasm about birds with others. The more people we can get on board with us and wanting to view these beautiful animals and wanting to protect these beautiful animals, the more of them we'll have around. And so those are some of the easy things everyone can do to help support bird populations. All right, so those are all the slides I have today. I know I ran a little bit over. I'm happy to stick around if you have any questions. I want to chat about birds in general. <laughs> December, I had two red-winged blackbirds at my bird feeder. Is that unusual? I mean, shouldn't they have been gone by then? I wondered why. This is another, you know, I think story that we're learning based on the change in our climate. I agree with you, Janet. You know, 20 years ago, if we were seeing red-winged blackbirds at our feeders now, it would be a wild bird. Why are they sticking around? Every winter, there seems to be more of these short-distance migrants hanging around. And so what you're seeing is something that I'm sure other people are seeing as well. What can be fun is to look at them and see if you can see some of the brown feathers on them. What I have found is a lot of the red-winged blackbirds that stick around are what are called hatchier birds. And these are young males that you know are young because they, they don't have that beautiful, you know, metallic black plumage yet. They still have some of their, their young brown feathers on them. So take a closer look. Yep. All right. Thanks for coming out today. Ho hope you learned something new. Hope you enjoyed it. I have a question. Yes. A mafia bird. Have you ever heard this? A mafia bird? Mafia bird. It's really, uh, now I could be dead wrong if I remember this, if I'm not remembering correctly. A cow bird. Oh, oh. Right? So um, what somebody told me was, a cowbird, what, has a black body and a brown head, or a black head and a brown body? It's a brown-headed cowbird. Okay. Yep. So, bad birds, because they will um, lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Their babies are bigger. So what happens is, when the babies um, are born, their heads are above other birds uh, baby heads because their babies are smaller that mom ends up feeding the cow bird babies and the babies of that real mom end up dying and sometimes those birds push them out of the nest and so she's like stealing the nest and the mother feeding she doesn't want to be responsible that other mother is and her and the cow birds end up being the ones to fly and get nurtured when the poor little birdies of the mother that's doing all the work end up perishing because they're not getting the food. Is that correct? It is. We call that nest parasitism, okay. where the female lays her egg in another bird's nest. So that's ridiculous. This is another example of people kind of muckying up nature. They're called cowbirds because this is a bird that historically was native to the Plains states. They actually followed around buffalo. And because buffalo were nomadic, and they kicked up insects and other things for the cowbirds to eat, the cowbirds hung out with the buffalo. Mm -hmm. Well, as European colonists came in, and of course, what did they do to our forests? They cut down all the forests. Right. It created that pasture-like atmosphere or habitat and the cowbirds slowly but surely expanded their range into our regions, right? At one point in time, if you were a bird, like a scarlet tanager or a yellow warbler, you could go deep enough into a forest to lay your eggs, and the cowbirds wouldn't bother you. Okay. But all our forests have been fragmented. It's either you know, a parking lot or a housing complex or a farm field, and now there's all these edges and the cowbirds can get in and they can parasitize a, a, a number of birds that evolutionarily didn't have to worry about. Them. Yeah, that's kind of weird. So that's, that's why they're a bit of a problem around here because they're, they're not a bird that is, is, I guess you can say, native 
to the east northeastern United States. Yeah, it's kind of, that's kind of a weird kind of bird. It is. It is. But you know what? If if you're nomadic, then it's evolutionarily speaking, it's really kind of clever that she can lay her egg and someone else will raise her young for her, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you always push mine out of the nest. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It sure is. They're a beautiful bird, though. The males, they're really stunning with the brown heads and the, the, the sleek black bodies. Well, this lady that told me about them called them mafia birds. Mafia. That's, what they, that's what they have a nickname of mafia birds. That's cool. Thank you so much. You're it was very, very informative. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.